Well, hello there, and welcome to our next In Conversation webinar with us here at Fabric. We're chatting about the future of radio with radio futurologist James Critland. James, thank you so much for your time today, and welcome to our webinar. It's nice to have you with us. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for asking. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have attendees from all over the world. Thanks to you, James, uh, not just here in South Africa, uh, also a number of our own clients of, of Fabric, but uh, radio sales houses, advertising agencies, independent radio, commercial, community and public broadcasters have all joined us. Uh, a lot of signups and attendees. Uh, if you'd like to, do post in the chat section uh, where you're attending from. It would be uh, great to have um, maybe the city or the country that you're, you're from. Pretty much like any radio station, you get the shout out if you are from the weirdest place. And remember, you can uh, also chat, pose questions, um, and we can tackle those later after James has done his presentation. Uh, James will unpack uh, Radio's future as it celebrates the 100th birthday as a commercial entity later this year in 2020. Can you believe it? Radio 100 years old. Uh, thank you for joining me again today. I'm Jonathan Lumley, Head of Clients, Channels and Markets. So to give you some context and why Fabric are bringing you this webinar today, it's that we've developed a suite of digital tools for radio and the platform is used to engage your audience, grow that community and get better and insightful data about them. Plus, you can make money by offering your clients inventory on this pure digital pl platform. James saw this last year at Radio Days Africa and even wrote about it in his column. We were very proud about that fact. And uh, that was with our Seychelles broadcasting client of two radio stations. Uh, James recognized the potential of the platform. And we've only managed to now pin him down for one of these webinars and also to highlight how far Fabric has progressed. I'd like to give you a glimpse into the platform first, and then James will share his insights on and views of the future of the radio. All right, so um, I see that uh, a lot of people have uh, messaged on the side there. From Cape Town to Austria, naturally, Johannesburg, of course, and uh, Melbourne, Australia, Holland, and Zurich. It's really great to have you with us. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and of course, uh, even from our own Durban, South Africa, and a beautiful day it is today as well. Let me uh, share my screen and take you through um, Fabric as it is and uh, what an incredible platform it is as well for radio. It is a suite of digital tools. As you probably aware, your radio station maybe looks a little bit something like this. Quite chaotic, it can be. Uh, and of course, you've got to uh, bring content to on-air 24-7 um, most of the time and then the catch up with broadcasts, uh, with podcasts, and you've still got your advertising to have to deal with. We bring it all together with a suite of digital tools that we call Fabric. It's available for your radio station as well. We'll give you the contact details at the end of this. It's just a quick glimpse before we get into James's uh, presentation, of course, the real reason why you're here today. As you can see on your screen, on the far right-hand side is the app itself. Now, this is not just a radio app. It's a full range of tools, a platform, if you will, which um, also brings together a number of other things. Um, it's fundamentally different from other radio apps. Firstly, it's the community aspect of the, uh, the app itself. It's your own ecosystem. Uh, you also get more delivery of data and analytics with um, our metric system plus Smashboard, which is just the left-hand side of your screen. That's the presenter view uh, where your uh, producers, community manager, et cetera, would uh, collate a lot of the messages. And then on the far left-hand side is Echocast. All of these we've actually explained a little bit before, and you're more than welcome to uh, go through the archive of our webinars and get to grips with more of the information on this. Let's start with the mobile app itself. On screen at the moment, you have uh, some screenshots of our Seychelles uh, broadcast uh, clients, and this is uh, Paradise FM. Of course, like all radio apps, you've got the, the live streaming, you've got um, your podcasts available in the rewind section, but more especially, you now use your own radio app to message the studio. You can do voice notes or just text. It creates high engagement, and you can have a private audience uh, from a perspective of a program manager or a PD, now able to contact his um, presenters. There's also direct alerts, and you can render anything from your website into the app, so there's no need to double uh, work, do double the workload. And it's um, available as an iOS and Android branded app. 
Of course, uh, voice notes, and this is where James actually talked about it uh, quite considerably last year in his um, in his newsletter, and that was around Seychelles Broadcasting uh, using voice notes. Ours, of course, is uh, a lot better than most other uh, voice notes apps, and you're able to send text with that voice note too, which means that you can collate a lot of the information. It's very useful, of course, and um, that can obviously go into its own um, its own competition pool, or if you are doing a particular uh, program around a topic, then the topics can also be uh, sent with the voice notes, so it's easy to find. Also, um, and this is where it's fundamentally different, uh, you've got the chat channels. Um, you can have read-only, broadcast-only channels. Uh, there's conversation channels too. Um, as I mentioned, private or by invite only channels. So this becomes a proper loyal fan base of super users and your your audience have to sign in uh, as a profile in order to message in these particular channels. Uh, you can then measure their engagement and you can get uh, the audience into channels that interest them the most. Maybe uh, it's only a channel for your uh, breakfast show or afternoon drive show or maybe for your events. Uh, this ecosystem is yours to engage with, yours to build and grow and then yours to monetize. And I will touch on that in just a short while. This is another one of our clients down in Cape Town, Smile 90.4 FM. And I just wanna to touch on the revenue aspect of this because it's now creating non-traditional digital um, revenue opportunities, real ones, because Fabric has an advertising engine built into it. There are billboards available, um, as we've always had, live stream pre-rolls and podcast pre-rolls, but then you can integrate any campaign, a competition or promotion, um, and even bring your clients sponsored channels. Just to quickly show you this, um, a few screenshots. On the far left-hand side, you've got a billboard that uh, would open up as you open the app. Then you've got a branded podcast just to the right of that. And then more especially, and this is unique to Fabric and it's not available in any other uh, radio app in the world, and that is client channels where you could have your own uh, client or advertiser touch base with your own um, community within the radio station app, which is incredibly powerful and you can bring them special offers as you've seen in the example on the right-hand side. There's also a service directory built in and you can have a dial board. Um, this allows the advertiser, if you wish, or the radio station as a direct call to action for people so that they don't have to remember telephone numbers. You just swim, uh, quickly touch the uh, telephone icon and down comes the screen and you're able to action those accordingly or use the concierge service which is a call me back feature which can be used for advertisers or for content on air it's an incredibly powerful tool here's another one of our clients and uh, we've featured on one of our webcasts recently um, where we talked about how they use the platform to have over 1.1 million people uh, message through the system Pretty amazing. Smashboard, as I mentioned earlier, is a single view dashboard. This is something that your presenters and your producers would use. Uh, it's also um, somewhere where the community manager or the uh, station manager might sit and see a lot of the information coming through from the audience. That's where the in-app messaging comes through from. That's where the voice notes are played out from. Um, and you can single view, see um, any particular information that you are requiring by filtering it. Uh, it is incredibly powerful too. Your reporting is very important and, and I'm sure James will be touching on this in his presentation in terms of analytics. Now, unlike nefarious or clandestine uh, apps that are stealing people's information, your audience will be delivering this information to you uh, because they offer it to you through the profile. But we're also able to pick up information like your live streams and the app sessions, how many downloads you've had of the uh, the app and how many registered users you have and the engagement that is taking place on the platform. As I say, I am only just touching on this and there's a lot more depth to this, but we uh, obviously wanted to highlight how brilliant this platform really is. And then there's Echocast. It's a real-time podcasting tool. It manages the live streaming on your website and through the app and it allows you a way to control your content and allow for retrieval of audio through the cloud. And it's all archived for you to call up and find. You can upload that audio in seconds. If, uh, if it was something that happened just in studio that was unexpected, you just go back on the broadcast. And because it's all 
uh, Cloud Archive with Microsoft Azure. Um, that audio is all backed up and safe and secure. It mitigates your risk of on-premises with uh, the Cloud Archive. And there's an audit trail, of course, which means you're compliant according to your regulatory needs. And here's just a snapshot of some of our clients. I know there are a few more now. And uh, some of them are probably going to message me now and say, well, why is my logo not there? But it's uh, good to have you with the webinar today. So just a few things you need to take away from this session. Uh, you use the app to build and own your community. This can be uh, for your listeners, uh, your audience, your clients, even your business. There's an entire feedback loop or conversation platform in this product that houses video, podcasts, live stream, and audio. And then there's the built-in analytics dashboard to analyze and see the engagement and understand your community. As I said before, Fabric is a powerful tool and your station can own it and operate it like many of our very successful clients. And some of them are already coming to revenue just from this product. This platform is very powerful. If you wanna know more or to book a demo or to go even deeper into Fabric, then please use that link. It's fabric.cloud forward slash radio for more information. So that's my little piece. Um, it's just a quick snapshot of everything uh, that we've been built, uh, that we've built here in little old Durban, South Africa. We are now going to uh, cross over to, to James, essentially, uh, with the future of radio, which celebrates its 100th birthday at the end of the year. It is remarkably resilient. Uh, but what about radio's future? Discover how listeners and technology are changing and what we can do to prepare for the next 100 years, hopefully. James is our radio futurologist. You know him. He's a writer, consultant, and public speaker on Radio's Future and has worked in radio since 1989. He is managing editor of podnews.net, which is a daily podcast newsletter, and runs media.info, the media information website. He's one of the organizers of Next Radio as well, the UK Ideas Conference uh, each September, and has worked with the world's largest radio conference, Radio Days Europe, uh, since its inception. Plus, he was also at Radio Days Africa just recently, sharing his views on the medium as well. It's a pleasure to have you with us again today, James. Thank you for your time. It's over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. That's very kind of you. And uh, yes, conferences, I remember those. They were fun, weren't they? A long, long time ago. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, joining me. And uh, there are a number of uh, names that I recognize uh, in the chat room. Uh, hello, Daryl. Hello, Rupert. Uh, and a number of uh, names that I don't recognize. And so very keen to get to uh, know uh, a little bit uh, more uh, of you. Um, this is a radio, as you can see here. This was my first ever radio, um, which was a radio that I got free with a packet of cereal, very sugary cereal um, <laughs> called uh, Frosties. Um, and this was the thing that actually got me hooked into what radio was capable of uh, doing. Radio is is an incredible thing, and uh, you know, and certainly having a look at what uh, radio can actually do, uh, both then, now, and uh, in the future, is certainly something. Uh, that I'd like to uh, focus on. Uh, let's start with my acknowledgement of country, though. I'm speaking to you from Brisbane in Australia. This is what Brisbane looks like. This is 10 minutes away, 10 minutes walk away from my house. Um, it's custodial land of the oldest living civilization in the world, and I'd like to pay my respects to both the Jagira people and the Turbal people and their editors uh, and their elders, past, present, and uh, emerging. Um, my history is as a radio person. Um, this is me as a radio presenter a long, long time ago, um, uh, uh, back uh, in a uh, local radio station, which now just broadcasts four hours of local programming uh, a day uh, in West Yorkshire in uh, the UK. Uh, also on this photograph is a very uh, famous radio presenter who moved on to be the breakfast show presenter at Radio One, the, um, the biggest um, top 40 station in the UK, um, and uh, then uh, is now uh, a breakfast presenter for Radio X, which is again a large national radio station. Uh, also on this particular uh, screen is somebody who's in prison for killing somebody, so let's move on. Uh, it's probably a good idea. Uh, what else do we have? Um, uh, I then moved away from um, uh, that to working behind the scenes, which is probably a good move for everybody. So I worked for uh, the original Virgin Radio in London, looking after what we did online and on uh, new uh, platforms um, and started a few uh, new things while I was there. So in 2005, 
produced the first podcast app, um, uh, the first podcast for a radio station, uh, the first daily podcast um, for the Pete and Jeff Breakfast Show, um, and also the first 3G tuner app, as we called it. Uh, it was a way of tuning in to the radio station live over your mobile phone. In case you wondered what it looked like, it looks like this. Uh, hideous old-fashioned thing um, if you look at it from these days, but uh, was quite successful back uh, in the day. Um, now, uh, then I went to work for uh, the BBC because that's the law and everybody has to in the UK at some point or other. Uh, worked on a piece of technology called Radio Player while I was there uh, as well. So yeah, so, so um, uh, it, it's absolutely fine talking about AM and talking about shortwave, but that's not radio. Radio is more than just AM and shortwave. So much though um, big, large, old-fashioned transmitters are important, actually radio is more than that. So I have a definition of uh, radio, which I'd like to share with you, which I think we all probably agree with, which is that radio is a shared experience with a human connection. That's what radio is really strong uh, in terms of uh, doing. The human connection is a very important thing. Um, and that um, shared experience is something that Spotify can't offer. It's something that somebody's CD player can't offer, and something that radio is very uniquely placed to give, that shared experience with that human connection, and that's really what radio excels at. There are some radio stations that just play nonstop music, and that's fine, and, and, and um, you know, if they want to do that, then that's cool, but there's no human connection there. There's no real shared experience there either. So real good radio is a shared experience with a human connection, and that's what I'm going to focus on uh, today. Of course, if you talk to some people about what the future of radio is, um, then, uh, then, then actually, you know, quite a lot of people will just sort of turn around and say, well, James, it's all very well, but actually, um, you know, radio clearly has no future. It's clearly old fashioned and everything else. If you go back to um, uh, this chap, he was Lord Kelvin. Uh, he was a very important person um, in uh, the House of Lords uh, in the early uh, 1900s. And he was asked, what's the future of radio? And he just turned around and said, radio has no future. So <laughs> I think goes to show that uh, you should never believe a futurologist. Um, he also said, by the way, that airplanes won't work and that x-rays are just a hoax. So it just goes to show. But what we do know is, of course, that people started buying radios. They were tremendously expensive back in those days. This was the first radio with a remote control, uh, which is very fancy. Um, and then, of course, television came came on, and everybody assumed that radio was going to die. Um, they assumed that uh, this was a very bad thing, uh, and that radio would never uh, survive uh, anymore. Um, but actually, of course, that wasn't the case um, uh, either. Um, we know that uh, new technology came along, and new technology fixed a lot of a, a lot of the things that radio had. So all of a sudden, we were we were uh, able to get radio into cars. Uh, we I were able to get we were able to get uh, radio uh, into uh, into our hands as well with uh, small transistor radios uh, as well. Um, but people still keep on talking about the end of radio. This is a uh, front cover of a magazine about 10 years ago showing the end of radio, as they called it. It's not really the end of radio because actually one of the things we do know is that radio is still tremendously powerful and tremendously used. Nine out of 10 people tune into the radio every single week. Um, and what I like about this is these aren't just numbers from one country or from two countries. These are numbers from all kinds of countries across the world. They're all worked out differently as well. Some countries work um, audio figures out using um, electronic measurement. Some people use um, all kinds of other things as well. Some people use diaries. Some people use telephone calls. But all of them really come back with this number, that nine out of 10 people listen to radio uh, every single day. Uh, and that's, uh, sorry, every single week. And that's a wonderful thing in terms of um, seeing that radio is a tremendously popular thing. 
it's not just radio. Um, radio is actually beating all kinds of other things as well. So if you look at the audio that we put into our ears here in Australia, two thirds of the audio that we put into our ears is live radio. Yes, there are things like Spotify and there's podcasts and stuff like that, but actually live radio does tremendously well. And that uh, is the same in the US as well, which also shows some really good figures uh, in terms of uh, live radio. Um, again, two thirds of um, audio that uh, Americans listen to is live radio. So live radio does particularly well uh, in terms of that. Radio also does really well in terms of um, throughout the day. So if you look at um, audio consumption throughout the day, really, you can see that radio has a tremendous peak in the early morning. So um, you can see that uh, large peak, which is about at eight o'clock uh, in the morning. Yeah, it's, um, it's, and then exactly. you can see uh, and then you can see other um, parts of uh, radio as well, in, including uh, on-demand music and listen again and podcasting and all that kind of thing. Um, and you can see that that, um, that is much, much smaller in comparison to live radio. So radio does really well during the day, which is important to remember. It's also important to remember that radio isn't just radio on a radio. This is how kids listen in the UK. I'll come back to UK figures um, uh, a little bit over the next 10 minutes because there are lots of uh, really good and open figures from the UK. And this shows how people are listening to the radio in, in the UK. Radio on a radio is very strong. Um, lots of people listen. They listen for a long, long time. But they're also listening on lots of other devices. All of the other green things on this uh, on this graph shows how people are listening to the radio. And they're listening in lots of different ways. Radio through tablets and through uh, smart speakers would be on, on, on this graph as well. And radio through through the TV and radio through catch-up services in, uh, South, in South Africa, of course, DSTV carries a lot of radio services as well as TV services. Uh, and that's sort of um, basically talking about um, make sure that you're not just thinking of, of yourself as an FM broadcaster, but of, uh, but of uh, other things as well. Uh, and, and I was just uh, diving into this and just sort of talking about how we consume radio on, uh, on other devices. Um, so here in this, uh, in this uh, screen, I'll make it a little bit bigger so that you can see it. Um, there are three different um, devices here, rather weirdly, on a beach. Um, one of them is a smart speaker. And um, if you look at the audio which you consume on a smart speaker, lots of that is to live radio. So smart speakers, particularly in places like the US and the UK, do really well in terms of uh, radio consumption. When it comes to um, when it comes to uh, uh, laptops and tablets, live radio still does really well. But this is the important thing. Mobile phones are very different. So live radio in all of its guises in terms of mobile phones is much, much smaller than on-demand content like podcasts or your own music collection uh, as well. It's worthwhile bearing that in mind and also worthwhile bearing in mind that different age groups also consume audio in a different way. So this is one way of, uh, of uh, this is uh, one uh, slice of audience, the 15 to 24 year olds, nice young people listening to a lot of live radio, yes, but also listening to a lot of on-demand content as well. And that compares very, very differently to how older people are consuming uh, radio as well. So you can see that there's a real uh, difference in terms of uh, radio consumption. So I think in terms of radio strategy, that there's two parts uh, to where the future of radio is going. Loudspeakers are for live radio, and very much so. Headphones are for on-demand radio. Um, headphones are for giving people things that they want to listen to right now, whereas loudspeakers are for accompanying people um, through what else that they're currently uh, doing. And that's um, possibly something worthwhile uh, having a think about. And this is something that um, I think is just worthwhile clocking, that while, yes, people are still listening to a lot of radio, the, this is a graph showing the people who are tuning into radio over the last 20 years, and it hasn't changed uh, at all, which is nice to uh, see. But the amount of time that they're spending has gone down. And that's something just worth clocking, that actually we have so much more opportunity for different audio now that live radio is 
being listened to for less time. It's still being listened to by the same amount of people, but being listened to by less time. Um, of course, some of that is going to podcasting, and podcasting skews younger. Uh, podcasting is, uh, you know, interesting to uh, all, all types of people now, um, but it's worthwhile bearing in mind that a lot of uh, audio listening is going to podcasting these days. And worthwhile also, again, just having a look at, you know, younger is important. This, again, is total radio. Bear that, uh, bear that in mind. New technology offers us uh, all kinds of interesting things. Uh, one of the, uh, this is how we used to edit uh, audio, of course. Um, then we moved to this sort of thing, um, a very nice fancy um, uh, audio editor, which many of you, uh, I'm sure, use. Audacity being a nice uh, free one, this being a uh, rather more expensive uh, one specifically built for radio use. Uh, these days, though, we're actually moving um, into um, audio editors that look a bit like this. So you can actually go in there, you can edit stuff, you can play around um, with uh, just the uh, text that you actually see uh, on the screen there. And uh, that then enables you um, to edit as if it was a Word document. Uh, which is a fantastic thing. The BBC have built a number of um, of interesting prototypes here. Um, and you look at these prototypes and you assume that that's not something which is available to the public. Um, and then you, you just have to have a look at this. This is a piece of technology called Descript. Um, I won't play you the audio because heaven knows what will go wrong there. Um, but in terms of uh, how this works, again, it's a piece of technology which uh, allows you to um, play uh, audio, to edit audio just using a word processor, and it does all of the audio editing for you. It's a fantastic uh, tool. And that enables you to do all kinds of other things. It enables you to um, to produce radio in a different way. This is a radio station um, on DAB in London, uh, but it's a radio station specifically for tradespeople, for people who are builders and decorators uh, and that sort of thing, because new technology allows radio to be much, much cheaper uh, now, which is a great thing. New technology allows radio um, in parts of Uganda to come from this. This is a bucket uh, which actually houses a mobile phone, which is a whole switching system for a radio station, which can, which is connected to it as well, uh, which enables live um, radio from uh, a separate studio or enables uh, on-demand content to be played live on the radio uh, from a mobile phone, which is in this bucket. Um, you can play around with um, things like uh, this radio station, Radio Driver, which is a radio station in Poland um, for, um, for Polish truck drivers who drive across Europe. The reason why this is available to them is that, um, is that uh, across Europe you get, uh, you get uh, free roaming on your uh, mobile phone, so you can use data as if you were at home. So it makes f for streaming radio um, uh, for that to be very, very cheap. Um, Coles Radio is a radio station which is um, for a supermarket here in Australia um, and uh, broadcasts uh, right, across, um, right across Australia on DAB as well as in store. Uh, which is a new and interesting way. And this is a radio station which doesn't actually have any studios at all. It's a radio station in Scotland uh, called Nation Radio. And all of their presenters present their shows from home. Now, if I was to be talking about this six months or so ago, um, you'd go, wow, that's amazing. Now I'm talking about it now. Everybody goes, yeah, 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 been there, done that um, because of the, uh, the, the pandemic, of course. Uh, but lots of different radio stations, this is a radio station in Petersfield doing much the same sort of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, radio stations um, are beginning to use technology in ways to actually help them make great new, uh, great new audio. Um, in ways that we'd never have thought of um, uh, in the past. But one thing I, I would like to uh, touch on is the primacy of live, um, is, is our tendency to think about radio as, as live radio being the most important thing. Um, because actually, when we talk about live radio, uh, we are talking about both live technology issues, um, 
there wouldn't be a technology if, issue if I was uh, pre-recorded for this. Um, but also, you know, we we talk about all of the uh, all of the problems and the hassles that you have with live radio. If you're doing an interview, you can't edit that interview. You can't edit it down to make it a snappier interview, a more interesting interview. You're stuck with whatever it is that you're actually broadcasting live, and that concerns me a little bit, particularly when our competitors can polish um, interviews, can make stories far more compelling by post-producing them. Um, if you haven't listened to an episode of the New York Times Daily yet, I would heartily recommend it, because instead of being a simple interview format with journalists, um, it's much more than that. It's a, it's a much more polished sounding news program on a podcast, um, and definitely worthwhile uh, having a listen to. Um, polishing things instead of broadcasting them live has other benefits, of course, because you can then take on-demand content uh, and, and broadcast it on your radio station. That works fantastically well, rather better, actually, than taking live uh, content and, um, and then having to edit it down for on-demand uh, consumption. So, you know, so that is uh, just sort of something worthwhile bearing in mind. And I think particularly uh, what happened this week, which is the launch of um, the Apple Music radio stations. Uh, Apple Music is a really interesting model, I think, for radio, because one of the things um, that Apple Music has done is it has three different radio stations now, uh, which are available for free to anybody with an iPhone or a Mac computer. And what it enables you to do is listen to um, all kinds of shows from these three live radio stations, either uh, in inverted commas live or on demand later. But when you listen to them, you realize that actually there's a bunch of uh, pre-production which has uh, gone on on these uh, shows. They've been specifically built for on-demand consumption and they're then broadcast on a radio station as well. And that means, of course, you can get more use out of your content. It means that you can put your content in loads of different places, um, and also means that, that the audio sounds as good as all of the other people that have been able to pre-produce and polish the audio that they've actually uh, worked on. So live and local, is um, an important um, part of radio, but I don't think it's the only part of the future of radio. And I prefer to look at uh, the future of radio as not just live and local, but as real and relevant. Real human beings, it's that human connection again, that shared experience bit, and the relevancy is important. Um, having a relevant uh, having relevant content may be talking about things that are going on locally to you, may be talking about things going on in Durban or in Cape Town or in Joburg um, or in places across the world, but it may also be talking about relevant things that are relevant to your audience, and that is just as important to knowing who your audience is, which is why having data, having stats, knowing where your audience is, who is listening uh, is a really important uh, tool. And we can get a lot more data and stats from online radio than we can from uh, FM and AM broadcast radio. Um, that's really helpful. And that will help, help us make sure that our content is still as relevant for the next generation um, as it's been for the previous uh, one. So the future of radio is, I hope, um, more than just live and local. I think the future of uh, radio is real and relevant. So what have I talked about? Um, the bits that you could hear, I've talked about radio being a human connection um, and a shared experience. I've talked about radio being very much multi-platform. Um, we need to, uh, I think, meet audiences where they are. Um, and I think it's a, a dumb broadcaster that tries to control them and sits there and goes, well, we are, we're a radio station, we're only going to broadcast on FM and AM, or we're only going to put our audio into our own app, or we're only going to um, make people, you know, people will have to consume on our terms. And that uh, might have worked 30 years ago, it doesn't work now. You can't control your consumer, because if you try and control your consumer by pushing them and bullying them into something that they don't want to end up doing, then they won't be your consumer anymore, because they won't 
they won't stand for any of that anymore. So I think making sure that radio is as multi-platform as we can be, making our content available in as many places as possible is really important. Having a distribution strategy that's device aware, I talked a lot about live radio versus on-demand radio, and on-demand radio clearly works on some devices. The more interactive the device is, the more interactive um, the uh, consumers are expecting their media consumption to be, and so on-demand works far more for them than uh, live radio. Getting the most out of your content um, is an important part, and the thing that... Um, I, get fr I guess frustrates me quite a lot about radio is that for quite a lot of us, we broadcast it, it's gone. We've just broadcast it once and away it's gone. And to me, that's a big mistake because we have so much access to so much great quality content. Why don't we make that available to as many people as we possibly can in as many different ways as we possibly can too? So live and local may not be the future, I say. Let's um, ensure that our output is real uh, and uh, relevant uh, as well, because that's also important. So with that, um, let's open it up to uh, questions and things, because that's probably a much better idea. Um, and, uh, and of course, if you'd like uh, more information on any of the uh, boring stats and things that I've uh, shown you, uh, then you're more than welcome to uh, get in touch. My email address is down there and uh, Twitter, which I'm currently taking a break from, but nevertheless is down there as well uh, if, you want to, uh, if you want to get in touch. I appreciate that. Thank you, James. Uh, and I think a lot of the people who uh, are on this uh, webinar appreciate the primacy of live, as you put it, yes? <laughs> which is always fun, which is always fun. Yes. Look, um, just to, to uh, and we are asking for questions just to be posted in the chat uh, section. So please go ahead if you have got uh, some questions for James. We've got a few minutes with him um, and would love to utilize it. From my side, I love the fact that you were talking about loudspeakers being live, headphones being on demand. Um, I think very, very pertinent. Um, clearly, I'm on demand today. Um, but despite the increase in the platforms, as you've, as you've mentioned, uh, like Deezer, Apple Music, mm. Spotify, the most popular way to discover new music still remains the radio. Uh, listening online via a computer or smartphone grows in popularity each year. You've shown that and in turn allows internet radio stations to expand their audience. But how do they match up to DAB? Uh, and I mean, you've got a view on that, James. Uh, there's some um, FM frequency transmitters now been turned off in certain countries in Europe, Scandinavia. Um, and in terms of new support, some ways in which people listen to music, Internet radio versus DAB, uh, your views on that? Well, I mean, so DAB is is another uh, broadcast radio standard. So it works in the same way as AM or FM radio. So it's, it's a speaker with a, a, an antenna uh, and a box. Here is a DAB radio. Um, and so it works in exactly the same way. So you don't have to pay for data rates. You don't have to pay for uh, for uh, anything else. And because of that, it is a great replacement, if you like, or addition to um, AM, FM broadcasting. Now, there's not much AM broadcasting in most countries now in the world, with the exception of here in Australia and the US and Canada, where AM is still incredibly strong. Um, but in much of the rest of the world, um, FM uh, is the predominant uh, platform. And that's fine if you're happy with the amount of choice that you get on, on uh, FM. And the big uh, opportunity that DAB offers is both uh, a lot more choice, so typically three, four times the amount of choice, but also the, uh, but also it's much, much cheaper as well. So in terms of um, being able to actually reach uh, a ton of audience, um, then you know another broadcast platform like DAB, you know, is a great uh, is a great platform to actually uh, you know to actually uh, do that. Broadcasting, therefore is still, I think, a very important uh, part. And everywhere that you look, you see a very small amount of uh, consumption of radio on, on, uh, online. So, you know, here in Australia, about 12%. Um, apparently, it's around 8% in the US. It's about 10% in the UK um, and uh, so on. So uh, that after you know, the first, uh, uh, the first 24 hour European radio station that started broadcasting in 1999, which was Virgin Radio, where I worked, uh, that 
um, you know, that that seems quite slow growth. And, um, and you know, other forms of broadcast radio seem to work rather better. So, um, so I don't think, you know, it's a conversation around DAB or FM or the internet. I think it's a conversation around having all of those. And yeah. some countries have worked out, well, we don't need to keep on paying for FM broadcasts anymore. Because One thing, just to get, get, get posed another, no, another question uh, as he's coming through. Radio in the future. Uh, I did read a statement, uh, James, to say, as long as radio fulfills its core task and provides the community... I've got got you. Fantastic. So as long as radio fulfills its core tasks and provides the community with local content, then radio will continue to be important in the future as it is today. So local is what radio is about. Data is the most important thing for a radio station because you need to know who your audience is um, if you're going to create good programming and attract new advertisers. Do you agree? Yes, I think I agree with uh, a lot of that. I think data is important and the amount of uh, data and information that you can get from online apps, particularly your own online apps rather than other people's online apps, uh, is very important. Um, and so it's important to have a look at what data and what information you have available uh, to you. Um, so that's that's a, a, a very important uh, important side, uh, you know. I think um, what it also means is that you can focus much more on uh, the um, on the commercial uh, opportunities that you have. So you so that, for example, you're not advertising alcohol to people under eighteen. You're not advertising, you know. Um, female uh, you know female shoes to um to a bloke's age 30 you know you're you're actually making sure that the advertising that you have is being targeted correctly that means that you can uh, earn more money out of it and that means that you can uh, actually keep the amount of interruptions down as well on the air which is i think an important an important thing so you know data audience data is a really is a really important and useful thing and you won't probably get an awful lot of that out of services like uh, TuneIn. you will get a lot, an, a lot more out of your own apps um, and it's really up to you to make sure that your apps are a better experience than uh, than uh, tune in or the other uh, radio apps that you may uh, see out there, um, and so that's where you know uh, working with a good app developer is an important part. Yeah, thank you for the semi endorsement there. Um, <laughs> one of our clients and segues quite nicely is uh, one uh, Naveen uh, down in Cape Town with Smile. He says, uh, "Do you think that radio is Mr. Beat by not keeping up with technology uh, in actual hardware?" He means uh, we went from stereo and then stopped. Uh, no 5.1 surround, no new sound bars, fewer devices actually have radio in an FM capacity. Well, um, uh, and I would say that one of the people reading this uh, or w watching this uh, seminar is, um, is a radio technologist called Rupert Brunn, who has done an awful lot of that sort of work of, you know, both uh, working on very high quality sound, but also working on uh, surround on 5.1 on uh, some very clever things where, for example, when you're watching the tennis, you can turn up or turn down the commentator and you can turn up or turn down the sound of the balls going back and forth, you know, and all of that. So, you know, there is a lot of technology which has been worked on. Um, and, you know, there are some great ideas. I think at the end of it, we shouldn't forget the radio is a is a habitual thing. We wake up with it, we fall asleep with it, we get it in the car. We have more than five radios each in most in most countries. So actually, getting new technology into households is a uh, very um, you know you need to be very patient. You need to work long and hard uh, at uh, doing that. And so I think that's the important uh, thing just to you know bear in mind is is that actually it takes a long time to get new technology um, into homes when you have something that is in, as so ingrained into our, um, into our lifestyle as radio is. Um, so, so I'm not sure that we've been particularly slow. I think it's just, uh, it's just a case of our wonderful position of being part of somebody's life every single day 
means that actually it's quite a big ask to go away and say, right, now you all need to buy a brand new radio or now you all need to, you know, um, start fiddling around with something which will give you perfect surround sound if you happen to have a living room with um, surround sound speakers, which guess what? Most people don't. Um, yeah. And and if you could get the music as well to actually be mastered in that as most uh, as most music that's played on most uh, stations isn't. So, you know, yeah. you've, you've obviously got that uh, that uh, side of it as well. Uh, another question uh, for you, James, uh, from Barack. Uh, if you could expand on the future of live radio on digital via the web, could live radio work for independent broadcasters as well or only as part of broadcasting station schedules? And where is the relevance of live radio in terms of content other than news updates or live events, as most content other than news could be consumed on demand, i.e. an expiration date? Comments yeah, and, and, you know, and... Um... Barack, um, you know, operates some fantastic radio conferences in Israel, which I've, uh, which I've, uh, you know, really enjoyed uh, being at one year. Um, and I think, uh, yes, you know, uh, uh, live radio is still a very important thing. You know, don't get me wrong. You know, live radio is how most people consume radio. But I think we need to just um, have a step back and consider that live broadcasting, which is, of course, what all broadcasting is, it's broadcasting things live, is not necessarily the same as our production. And if we start with live radio, we're probably starting with live radio because it's cheap, because it's easy to make, because we can do it and it just gets broadcast. If we were to focus a little bit more on producing um, audio content that works really well, both on demand and live, um, and that means not thinking about live first, but thinking about on demand first. You can still broadcast all of that stuff on the air, but it sounds so much more polished. It sounds so much more competitive with all of the other audio that we actually have available. Um, so I'm not saying get rid of all of your live people in your studio because that's uh, an important part of what radio is. But if you're going to have an interview, if you're going to... Um, if you're going to do, you know, um, uh, stories, if you're going to do anything which is uh, more than just one person talking, um, then, uh, you know, if you can actually look at that from an on-demand point of view and make a lovely polished piece of audio that works well both on the radio but also works well on demand, I think that's uh, that would get far more value out of the great radio that you're making. And, of course, you can play it more than once as well, which is an important side. Indeed, indeed. Um, I'd like to get through as many as I can mm. in this uh, last couple of minutes. DAB, AM, FM will not be the future as IP-based services will be everywhere, also uh, at the or in the car, says Benjamin. Why should I use broadcasting technologies while there are so many IP-based audio services? Yeah, and I think Benjamin's, um, Benjamin is saying exactly what I've been hearing for the last 30 years. The question is uh, when this is going to happen. Um, I was asked uh, in an ABC board meeting uh, here, I was, I was told, I see DAB as being an interim technology. Uh, and eventually everybody will go to IP. And I said, I completely agree that the problem is we don't know whether it's interim for five years or for 50 years, but I suspect not just for five years. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, undoubtedly the way that we consume audio, the way that we consume radio will continue to change. But the one thing I can absolutely guarantee as a futurologist, I can ab absolutely guarantee is that change will be much slower than we think it's going to be because of the habitual nature of radio, because of the way that we consume radio right now. Um, so, um, you know, and certainly all of the countries which are putting DAB to air are seeing, you know, a lot of listening to, um, to DAB. Some radio stations don't like it because that means an awful lot more competition. Um, but actually, it's good for the audience. And that's what we should probably be focusing on here. Mm -hmm. Well, I see one from Argentina, Guillermo, um, says mm. Spotify vision of being an audio platform. And I think this is close to your heart. You've written about it a couple of times, actually, uh, James, not just music. That seems to be successful for now, but they have a plan to have radio content or more specifically live audio. What do you think about this related to the vision of having a single platform for audio? Yeah, I mean, I think Spotify is very, very interesting to, um, you know, to look at. Um, they're very much focusing on audio in all of its guises. Um, they are hiring at the moment, podjobs.net, 
very good website. They're hiring at the moment for a head of audiobooks, um, which I think says quite a lot in terms of where their uh, their focus is going. Uh, so you'll be able to consume music. You'll be able to consume uh, podcasting and uh, radio type programs, but also audiobooks and other things as well. Um, so I think you, you know you can see a bunch of a bunch of you know fascinating things coming out of um, of, of uh, Spotify. They are only uh, for all of the noise. They are only responsible for about ten percent of all podcast plays at the moment. Apple still has seventy percent. Comes back to what I was saying earlier about habit. Um, so I think we should bear that in mind. It also says something about the marketing of uh, Spotify. I think James, uh, we have lost your audio one last time. Sorry, James. We have lost your audio one more time. Just, just as we're like wrapping things up, I'm, uh, I do apologize. Um, it's been one of those uh, interesting hours, and I have a feeling that it might have to do with a whole number of things that um, we've I'm, been dealing with I'm, today. I'm, I'm blaming Australian internet. That's what I'm blaming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could blame a whole load of things from Seacon cables to possibly load shedding, but <laughs> I have a feeling that it just it might be just cursed for us today. That's that's really it. Um, I think <laughs> one last question before I let you go, and yeah. maybe it's um, it's tempting fate with this microphone and audio. How do you attract a younger audience since they're exposed uh, to so much more content on the internet, or is it just traditional transition people make uh, while becoming young working adults? Um, I think there's a part of that. Yes, absolutely. And I think also, um, you know, making sure that your programming is right is an important is an important part. If you look at the US, uh, the US doesn't seem to care about young audiences um, because they're there chasing the old consumers of radio. Um, and that's fine. But if you don't replenish your audience, then your audience will, by definition, die. Um, and I think it's a big mistake that the U.S. radio market is is making um, to focus on older audiences and not focus on younger audiences, um, particularly in terms of talk, um, but also in terms of of uh, music as well. So I think um, making sure that your programming is relevant is important, and public service broadcasting has a lot um, uh, there in terms, uh, has a lot of responsibility there because public service broadcasting, you know, is a hugely important, um, part of the broadcast landscape, but they can do things that commercially doesn't work. And certainly when you have a look across Europe, when you have a look in, um, many places, including, uh, South Africa as well, public service broadcasting is where the young people are are, uh, are uh, tuning in because they uh, they actually appreciate that they can get relevant um, programming for them. So um, I think you know having that good media ecosystem in every country is really important. Thank you, thank you very much. I think on that note, and seeing that we actually managed to keep a, li a live feed uh, for the end of that, uh, James Cridland, thank you very much <laughs> for your time today. It's a great um, pleasure. Really and, and if anybody wants to continue the conversation, of course, you know, my email, uh, james at crid.land. Um, I'm very happy to uh, carry, carry that on on email. That'd be great. I appreciate that. Thanks for the offer. Um, and I think testament to you as a broadcaster for all the hiccups and still being able to continue in the professional manner you did. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great um, pleasure. To everybody else, thank you very much for joining us today well, on the webinar with uh, Fabric. And if you'd like to know more, please visit us at fabric.cloud uh, forward slash radio for more information about our product. And as James has uh, mentioned there, you're more than welcome to contact him on his email address. And I, I can honestly vouch for the fact that he does come back to you on, on his email. Uh, eventually. eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thank you very much for your time, sir. We well, hope to do it so again. Thank you so much, everybody watching as well. I appreciate it. Fly. When you're able to fly and we will meet up again uh, here in South Africa or possibly over in Australia. Indeed. Thank you very much, James, and have a great uh, day, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, folks.